What's the state of your marriage right now? Are you going through some difficulties? Are you finding that your marriage is in maybe some difficulty or troubles? Our Lord is going to talk about marriage, but the context is very problematic. If you have your Bibles open, I would encourage you to now look with me at Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 down to verse 6. It reads like this, Then the Pharisees came unto him, that's unto Jesus, testing him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have you not read that from he who made them at the beginning made them both male and female? And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The context is this, that Jesus is in Perea. If you look at the first two verses, he's left Galilee. He's coming now on the eastern shore of the Sea of, of the uh, Jordan River. And as he comes now to the very location where John the Baptist had been imprisoned, this is the area that Herod Antipas is the governor these Pharisees now have come to him. The Pharisees were in Jerusalem. They traveled a day's journey. They went down the Jericho Road. They crossed over the Jordan River. They now go into Perea. They have made a deliberate travel, a, a pilgrimage for the purpose of addressing Jesus. Jesus is with a large crowd. It says there's a great multitude with them. They have a great audience. They have come to Jesus, and they come with a theological question. Why? Why this question? And why now? Why not wait till he went to Jerusalem? Why not do it in a, in a sequestered area where they were just with him alone? Why do it so publicly? Well, we find in verse 3, they came unto him testing him. They came with the intent of now putting him on the spot. And they are testing him because there has been a great debate about divorce. There is even today. It's hard to pick up a book on the subject of divorce and not find disagreement among the authors. It's hard to go to a church and not find a pastor that disagrees with all of the other pastors in the community about the subject of divorce. And so they are trying to get Jesus to take sides. In the day in which these Pharisees have come, there was the school of Hillel, which was also the characteristic of many of the Sadducees, who, that was very liberal and that applied to just anyone. Anyone could get a divorce for almost any cause. In fact, if a man woke up in the morning and decided, you know, I didn't like the breakfast she made, then I could divorce her. Or there is the other school of Shammai, which was much more conservative, but hey, it was still causes and various reasons for divorce. But this is the same area where John the Baptist had challenged Herod Antipas and said that it was unlawful for him to marry his brother's wife. And for that cause, John the Baptist loses his head. This is a great divide. But is that the only reason why they are tempting him? The temptation is very real. And that is, will Jesus side with a partisan view? Will he side with the Pharisees? Will he side with the Sadducees? Or maybe will he side with the Romans and the Herodians? Will he side with John the Baptist? Who will he side with? And Jesus doesn't do that, but that is the temptation. And for those of us who are in the United States, today is Election Day. It's very easy to make the partisan politics the divide or the purpose, the foundation on which you stand. It is not ultimately about politics. It is about righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation, not a party. And so it's very, very important that as a Christian, you're looking at what does God say? And that is where the temptation is. They want to drag Jesus into their debates. They want to drag Jesus into their partisan politics. And Jesus is not going to go for it. It's important that you and I are ones who 
say, thus saith the Lord, and not what a particular party or group of people or even a great leader may say. And so these Pharisees are testing him and they say to him, is it lawful? The very word that is used there for lawful is actually to adjudicate or to legislate. In other words, they want to know how is what your opinion, is it permissible to take the law that was established and interpret this way or that way? They want to know their interpretation. And so therefore he goes on and they ask for a man to put away. Well, the word put away is actually a euphemism for divorce. His wife, and then notice that little phrase, for every cause. They're not asking about the legitimacy of divorce. They're asking for the basis for that divorce. Ah, that's really significant, isn't it? Jesus is now going to respond. Verse 4, notice how he responds. He says unto them, have you not read? Oh, Jesus is talking to the most erudite scholars of his day. These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are a part of the Sanhedrin. It is a small group of the Pharisees, and they're more the conservative ones of the political religious leaders. And Jesus asks them, have you not read? Well, it's what Jesus is referring to that they have read. You see, these are oftentimes, as many scholars today, that they have read lots of books about other books written by other scholars. But have we read the scriptures? It's important that you read devotionals. It's important that you read commentaries. But don't let that be the basis for your understanding, your view, your faith. May it be the, the sincere milk of the word that you are desiring, that it is the word of God that you look to first. I encourage you, before you ever look at a text, don't listen to a YouTube presentation, even by me. Instead, go to the Word of God. That's what Jesus is asking. Have you not read? Of course they've read. They haven't looked and read the Scriptures. Oh, that's really important, isn't it? And now notice what he says. Have you not read that he, now that's God, who made them in the beginning, made who? Made man and woman. Now, that's important. Remember, it's Genesis, Bershit, chapter 1, verse 27. God said, let us make man in our image. Male and female made he them. In other words, the very characteristic of male and female is a reflection of the Trinity. Isn't that amazing? It is a reflection of the unity of God in the difference between male and female. Now let's go on because Jesus doesn't go to that passage. He instead goes to another that's in chapter 2 of Genesis. And you see the way in which Jewish thought is, is that you go to the law of first reference. You won't go to Malachi chapter 2 where it says God hates divorce. Yeah, that's a great passage, and that is true. But you would want to know why he hates divorce, and he would take you back then to back in Genesis, the first time that it is used. And therefore Jesus says, Have you not read in the beginning he made them male and female? And for this cause, now they had just used that word cause. They want to know, can they for every cause put away their wives? And Jesus says, no, it's this cause, for this reason, for this purpose. And it's looking and understanding that marriage has a purpose. Your marriage has a purpose. And that a man shall leave, and now we're in Genesis. And here it is, I'm going to go back to Genesis, and Jesus is quoting the same passage. And it is in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 23, that Adam said, well, let me go to verse 22, and that God took the rib, literally it's the side, not necessarily a bone or a rib, but he took the side out of man and he made woman and brought them unto man. In other words, it's a half of Adam. So that male have XY chromosomes and 
females have XX chromosomes. It's half. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, that she came out of me. We were one to start with. And now in order to have a family, in order to have a progeny, in order to have children, we are now two, but the two were one flesh. Now, Jesus, God goes on to say, uh, and it's Adam, it's actually speaking, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Jesus is using the same expression. The therefore is because they began as one. There's a unity. That unity reflects the deity. And therefore, that's why this issue of divorce is so controversial. I think it's controversial, not just politically and not just personally, because it hurts. Anyone that's been through a divorce knows the pain that they suffered. It doesn't matter which side. Everyone gets hurt. The children get hurt. The extended family gets hurt. All the friends get hurt. The assembly is hurt because of divorce. Divorce is something that Satan loves to divide. God is about, and he has given us the Holy Spirit as a ministry of reconciliation, and the very purpose of marriage is unity, and that unity is what Jesus is reflecting to, and the word leave, it's the same word for death. It is the idea of what happens after a death, the leaving, the departing. And then the departing from father and mother, but the cleaving, the word cleaving is in the passive future. It it is the idea, if it's passive, it happens to us. The cleaving is automatic, and it happens as a result of the physical union, but it's more than the physical union. In in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 7, Paul talks about there being also a spiritual union, When he talks about, do you not know that he who has fellowship with Belial, they they actually create a union? And that if you have fellowship or you have a union with a harlot, you are also uniting with the spirit of that harlot? There is not only a union that's physical, it's a union that's spiritual. And that's why Satan wants to divide marriages. And that's why you and I need to fight for our marriage and fight for the unity to maintain, as Paul writes, maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so consequently, the cleaving means literally to be inseparably glued. Once there is a oneness that can't be broken except by death. And then they are no longer two but one flesh. Jesus then concludes, Wherefore they are no more two but one. What therefore God hath joined, let not man put asunder. So now, did he side with Hillel? No. Did he side with Shammai? No. Did he side with the Herodians? No. What did he side with? Well, remember, Jesus is God. And that God is the one that in the very beginning, and it is Jesus who divides then that side of Adam and takes that which which was one, makes it two for the purpose of then maintaining that unity which will now picture the Trinity. You, your marriage is such a great picture, isn't it? In fact, at most Christian weddings, we begin by emphasizing the mystical union that exists between Christ and his bride, the church. Yes, if you're a husband, then be the house band that keeps your family together. Do everything you possibly can to maintain what God has decreed. The world wants to attack. These Pharisees tried to. Don't let them win. You stand strong in your marriage. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, that you have given us the gift of marriage. You've given us the union, the relationship that we have with our spouse. And that if, Father, we do not have a marriage, then we pray, Father, that you would enable us to encourage others that are married and that we would, Father, maintain that relationship that is a picture 
of the relationship between the believer and the groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us now as we look at our Lord and the debates that he is being thrust into to also see our responsibility in responding to the uh, arguments of the world, always to go back to the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.